Peace of England, peace of Ireland, peace of every land and clime. Hearken to my joyful tidings of the golden future time. Mr. Jones of the Manor Farm had locked the hen houses for the night, but was too drunk to remember to shut the pop holes. With the ring of light from his lantern dancing from side to side, he lurched across the yard, kicked off his boots at the back door, and made his way up to bed. As soon as the light in the bedroom went out, there was a stirring all through the farm buildings. Word had gone round that old Major, the prize middle white boar, had had a strange dream and wished to communicate it to the other animals. It had been agreed that they should all meet in the big barn as soon as Mr. Jones was safely out of the way. At one end of the barn, on a raised platform, Major was already ensconced on his bed of straw under a lantern. He was twelve years old, a majestic-looking pig with a wise and benevolent appearance. Before long, the other animals began to arrive. First came the three dogs, Bluebell, Jesse and Pincher, and then the pigs, who settled down in the straw immediately in front of the platform. The hens perched on the window sills, the sheep and cows lay down behind the pigs. The two cart horses, Boxer and Clover, came in together, walking very slowly and setting down their vast hairy hooves with great care, lest there should be some small animal concealed in the straw. Clover was a stout, motherly mare approaching middle life. Boxer was an enormous beast, nearly eighteen hands high and as strong as any two ordinary horses put together. After the horses came Muriel, the goat, and Benjamin, the donkey. Benjamin was the oldest animal on the farm and the worst tempered, but he was devoted to Boxer. When Major saw that the animals had all made themselves comfortable, he cleared his throat and began. Comrades, I do not think that I shall be with you for many months longer, and before I die I feel it my duty to pass on to you such wisdom as I have acquired. Now, what is the nature of this life of ours? Let us face it, our lives are miserable, laborious, and short. We are born, we are given just so much food as will keep the breath in our bodies, we are forced to work to the last atom of our strength, and the very instant that our usefulness has come to an end, we are slaughtered. The life of an animal is misery and slavery. That is the plain truth. But is this simply because this land is so poor that it cannot afford a decent life to those who dwell upon it? No, comrades. The soil of England is fertile. Its climate is good. This farm of ours would support a dozen horses, twenty cows, hundreds of sheep, and all of them living in a comfort and a dignity that are now almost beyond our imagining. Why then do we continue in this miserable condition? Because nearly the whole of the produce of our labor is stolen from us by human beings. There, comrades, is the answer to all our problems. It is summed up in a single word, man. Man is the only creature that consumes without producing. He does not give milk. He does not lay eggs. He is too weak to pull the plow, yet he is lord of all the animals. Only get rid of man, and the produce of our labor would be our own. Almost overnight we could become rich and free. What then must we do? Why, work night and day for the overthrow of the human race. That is my message to you, comrades. Rebellion. I do not know when the rebellion will come. It might be in a week or in a hundred years, but I know that sooner or later justice will be done. Fix your eyes on that, comrades. And remember that in fighting against man, we must not come to resemble him. Even when we have conquered him, do not adopt his vices. No animal must ever live in a house or sleep in a bed or wear clothes, or drink alcohol, or smoke tobacco, or engage in trade. All the habits of man are evil. And above all, no animal must ever tyrannize over his own kind. Weak or strong, clever or simple, we are all brothers. 
No animal must ever kill another animal. All animals are equal. And now, comrades, I will tell you about my dream of last night. It was a dream of the earth as it will be when man has vanished. But it reminded me of something that I'd long forgotten. The song my mother used to sing. It is called Beasts of England. Old Major cleared his throat and began to sing. It was a stirring tune, something between Clementine and La Cucaracha. Beasts of England, beasts of Ireland, beasts of every land and clime, hearken to my joyful tidings of the golden future time. Soon or late the day is coming, Tyrant man shall be o'erthrown, and the fruitful fields of England shall be trod by beasts alone. The singing of this song threw the animals into the wildest excitement. Almost before Major had reached the end, they had begun singing it for themselves. The cows lowed it, the dogs whined it, the sheep bleated it, the horses whinnied it, the ducks quacked it. Unfortunately, the uproar woke Mr. Jones, who sprang out of bed and let fly a charge of number six shot into the darkness. The pellets buried themselves in the wall of the barn, and the meeting broke up hurriedly. Everyone fled to his own sleeping place, and the farm was asleep in a moment. Three nights later, Old Major died peacefully in his sleep. This was early in March. During the next three months, there was much secret activity. Major's speech had given to the more intelligent animals a completely new outlook on life. They saw clearly that it was their duty to prepare for the rebellion. The work of teaching and organizing fell naturally upon the pigs, who were recognized as being the cleverest. Preeminent among them were two boars named Snowball and Napoleon. Napoleon was a large, fierce-looking Berkshire boar, with a reputation for getting his own way. Snowball was more vivacious, quicker in speech, and more inventive. All the other male pigs on the farm were porkers. The best known was a small fat pig named Squealer, who was a brilliant talker. The others said of Squealer that he could turn black into white. These three had elaborated Old Major's teachings into a system of thought to which they gave the name of animalism. Several nights a week, they held secret meetings in the barn and expounded the principles of animalism. Now, as it turned out, the rebellion was achieved much earlier and more easily than anyone had expected. In past years, Mr. Jones had been a capable farmer, but of late he had fallen on evil days. He had taken to drinking. His men were idle, the fields were full of weeds, and the animals were underfed. June came and the hay was almost ready for cutting. On Midsummer's Eve, Mr. Jones went into Willingdon and got so drunk that he did not come back till midday. The men had gone out rabbiting without bothering to feed the animals. When Mr. Jones got back, he immediately went to sleep, so that when the evening came, the animals were still unfed. At last they could stand it no longer. One of the cows broke in the door of the store shed and all the animals began to help themselves from the bins. It was just then that Mr. Jones woke. The next moment he and his men were in the store shed lashing out with whips. This was more than the hungry animals could bear. With one accord, though nothing had been planned beforehand, they flung themselves upon their tormentors. After only a moment, the men took to their heels. And so, almost before they knew what was happening, the rebellion had been successfully carried through. Jones was expelled, and the manor farm was theirs. For the first few minutes, the animals could hardly believe in their good fortune. Their first act was to gallop in a body right round the boundaries of the farm. Then they raced back to the farm buildings to wipe out the last traces of Jones's hated reign. The harness room was broken open. The bits, the nose rings, the dog chains, the cruel knives were flung down the well. Then they sang Beasts of England from end to end seven times, and after that they settled down for the night 
and slept as they had never slept before. But they woke at dawn as usual, and suddenly remembering the glorious thing that had happened, they all raced out into the pasture together. Yes, it was theirs! In the ecstasy of that thought, they gambled round and round. They hurled themselves into the air in excitement. Then they filed back to the farm buildings and halted in silence outside the door of the farmhouse. That was theirs, too. But they were frightened to go inside. After a moment, however, Snowball and Napoleon butted the door open and the animals entered. They tiptoed from room to room, gazing with awe at the unbelievable luxury, at the beds with their feather mattresses, the looking-glasses, the horsehair sofa. Some hams hanging in the kitchen were taken out for burial, otherwise nothing was touched. A unanimous resolution was passed on the spot that the farmhouse should be preserved as a museum. All were agreed that no animal must ever live there. The animals had their breakfast, and then Snowball and Napoleon called them together. Comrades, said Snowball, we have a long day ahead of us. Today we begin the hay harvest, but there is another matter that must be attended to first. The pigs now revealed that during the past three months they had taught themselves to read and write from an old spelling book which had been thrown on the rubbish heap. Napoleon sent for pots of paint and led the way down to the five-barred gate that gave on the main road. Snowball took a brush between the two knuckles of his trotter, painted out Manor Farm, and in its place painted Animal Farm. This was to be the name of the farm from now onwards. After this, Snowball and Napoleon explained that the pigs had succeeded in reducing the principles of animalism to seven commandments. The commandments were written in great white letters that could be read thirty yards away. They ran thus, Whatever goes on two legs is an enemy. Whatever goes on four legs or has wings is a friend. No animal shall wear clothes. No animal shall sleep in a bed. No animal shall drink alcohol. No animal shall kill any other animal. All animals are equal. Now, comrades, cried Snowball, to the hayfield. Let us make it a point of honour to get in the harvest more quickly than Jones. But at this moment the cows set up a loud lowing. They had not been milked for twenty-four hours and their udders were bursting. After a little thought, the pigs milked the cows. Soon there were five buckets of frothing creamy milk at which many of the animals looked with considerable interest. What is going to happen to all that milk, said someone. J Jones used to sometimes mix it in our mash, said a hen. Never mind the milk, comrades, cried Napoleon. That will be attended to. The harvest is more important. Comrade Snowball will lead the way. I shall follow in a few minutes. Forward, comrades! The hay is waiting. So the animals trooped down to the hayfield, and when they came back in the evening, it was noticed that the milk had disappeared. Bill Nye was reading Animal Farm by George Orwell, abridged by Richard Hamilton, and produced by Dice Beers, and produced by Dice Beers, and produced